Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This Tuesday marks the 241st year of America's signing of the Declaration of Independence. Did you know that more than half of all of the soldiers and officers in the American army were Presbyterian? And all but one of the colonels serving were Presbyterian elders. Military leaders reporting to King George III and Parliament seemed to know this best. Letters from this time period included words like, Call this war whatever you may call it, but don't call it an American revolution or rebellion. It's nothing more or less than the Scots-Irish Presbyterian Rebellion. Another letter wrote, Presbyterianism is really at the bottom of this whole conspiracy and will never rest until something is decided. Even Prime Minister Horace Walpole rose up into the British Parliament and said to King George III, there's no use crying about it. Cousin America has eloped with a Presbyterian parson. (laughs) That Presbyterian parson he was referring to was John Witherspoon. President of Princeton University, Presbyterian minister, the only minister that signed the Declaration of Independence, joined by nine of his students who also became leaders in the Presbyterian Church. These men and others are considered the founding fathers of our country, along with leaders such as Patrick Henry and Reverend James Caldwell, both Calvinists and Presbyterians. Who did these Presbyterians think they were? standing up and standing against what was unfair and unjust in the treatment of the people. Who were they to fight against the British monarchy, called out by God to lead a revolt? Historian George Bancroft called John Calvin the father of America and stated that anyone who does not honor the memory and respect Calvin's influence knows little of American liberties. These stirrings of upset Presbyterians started even years before the Declaration was signed. Throughout the American colonies, but particularly here in North Carolina, local leaders were coming together to oppose the current situation in the 1700s. We see it in the Mecklenburg Declaration, signed on May 20th of 1775 in Charlotte, North Carolina. In this declaration, 27 Calvinists, a Presbyterian minister, and another third of ruling elders signed this declaration, including Ephraim Brevard, of who Brevard, North Carolina, is named for, all of them announcing their independence from the British monarchy. Eleven months later, on April 20th, 1776, the Halifax Resolve was another declaration presented unanimously by 83 delegates. All of these declarations predated our Virginia neighbor's resolution, the Lee Resolution. That was taken to the Second Continental Congress in June of 1776. All of these stirrings, all of these people ready to sign the Declaration of Independence. It's also important to note that both the Mecklenburg Declaration and the Declaration of Independence have these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The only thing I'd change is that's men and women. For those of you who grew up in North Carolina and are steeped in North Carolina history, this might come as no surprise to you. But for those of us that are transplants, I'm a little bit sinfully proud to be a Presbyterian this weekend. We can see throughout history, Presbyterian-flavored Christians have always been stirring up some trouble. We look way back, back to the 16th century in Europe, where our Presbyterian forefathers started the Protestant Reformation. One of those mantras that is essential for them and is essential even for us, foundational to who we are as Christians today, is this Latin phrase, Ecclesia Reformata, Semper Reformanda, Secundum Verbi Dei. That translates, 
the church reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God. Reform. Reform where it is advocated, grounded in scripture. Reformanda meaning returning to the root. The reformers believed it had become corrupt in the 16th century. So change was needed. Returning to the roots and being grounded yet again in scripture was important, essential to turn away from human interests of power and success, return to the root, listen for the word of God. But it did not mean just for self-preservation. It certainly was not with closed-mindedness. No. Returning to the root of God's word meant listening for and responding, responding to God's call and command to see how God and God alone might make things new. For inherent in that phrase is that God was and is and will always be at work in our personal lives, in the lives of our families, in our communities, our countries, and our world. Reformed and always being reformed according to God's word reminds us that God, through the Holy Spirit, is changing each of us, reforming us. We are God's children and we belong to God. And as God's children and God's people, we have a responsibility. It's not simply to listen for God's call, but to respond to God's call and to become agents of change in our world. When we hear and respond to God's call, theologian Harold Nebelsack explains that we receive the activity of the Holy Spirit. So it not only transforms us, but transforms the church of God. So reform is to look back at what has been and to look forward with open eyes to see the vision God might have for our world. To reform and to be reformed is to say yes. Yes to the ultimatum of being a change agent in the world. Throughout the centuries, our confessions have showed us that Christians do not sit on the sidelines as all that is happening in our culture and our world happens our confessions are we take stands throughout the centuries, stands of what it means to belong to God, to follow God, to believe in God, to be active in the world. We are called to be change agents where we speak up and speak out against injustice, tyranny, and the oppression of God's people. The Presbyterian Confession of 1967 underscores this teaching. As God has spoken his diverse word in cultural situations, the church is confident God will continue to speak through the scriptures to each person in every form of human culture and our changing world. I think this idea of reform and returning to the root and changing of ourselves and of our communities is at the heart of call of Moses today. This ancient dialogue between Moses and God shows what God's intentions are and God's ultimatum to Moses, and then indirectly to us as we are descendants of Moses. Listen again to what God says to Moses in verse 7 through 10 of chapter 3. This time I want you to listen for the verbs. Listen for each verb. How God uses how God is active and present to the lives of those who are held in captivity by the Egyptians. God says to Moses, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Observed, heard, seen, known. The misery, the cries, the oppression, the suffering. God has been present this whole time. The Israelites have been treated cruelly. Well, Moses is probably thinking, well, thank goodness you've showed up. Get in there and do something. Oh, Moses, 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 really? 
Moses, do you really think that God is going to do this without you? Throughout the scriptures, we see that God is always calling ordinary, everyday people like Moses, like you and me, to do extraordinary things in the name of God. What are the very next words God says in that chapter and verse? Yatsa, Moshe. Yatsa. The Hebrew word for come and go, lead, bring forth, carry out, deliver. Every time you see the word go in the Hebrew scripture, that is how it is translated. Yatsa. Moses, go deliver my people. Go and be my change agent in the world. Now, Moses was a bright man. He'd been through a lot in his lifetime already. If we look back through the book of Exodus, he really wasn't even supposed to be alive. He was born to Jacob an Israelite slave during a time when the Egyptian pharaoh was killing baby boys for fear of the revolt that they might lead against him. Moses' mother couldn't bear that thought. And so she hid him in a basket and sent him down the Nile River only to be found by Queen Bithia, Pharaoh's daughter. And she raised him as one of her own. He was one of the few Hebrew infants to survive. He grew up in the Egyptian palace. He saw the wrath and tyranny of Pharaoh. Moses was troubled by that until one day when he could not contain it any longer, he killed an Egyptian slave master who was brutally beating a Hebrew slave to death. Then he himself had to flee to the land of Midian for safety. Moses had seen enough. He'd seen the misery of the people. And so when chapter 3 begins, Moses is content, minding his own business, watching over his flock, loving his wife, Sephora, having children. Doesn't it seem that it's always when we're minding our own business that God calls upon us? Well, doesn't just call. God commands us, demands us, yatsa. And even we, wise people like Moses was, found by God, when we know it's that still, small voice, or maybe it comes in a whirlwind or a burning bush, We make excuses. Moses was the master of excuses. He has five of them trying to get out of this call. He's a misfit. He's run away. He stutters. He's not going back. So you think, Moses. You and I both know that Moses can resist the call all he wants. But when the great I am shows up and tells you to go, Ultimately, we surrender. We surrender to who we are and whose we are. We are God's people, and God needs us, each and every one of us, to be change agents in this world. Are you afraid? Me too. A little afraid I'm not up for the challenge, a little afraid I'm not as gifted as God seems to think I am, but, you know, we all have been given an ultimatum. If we truly say that we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we truly say that the great I am is our God, we cannot say no. I've been reading a lot about change agents in our country. I wanted to share with you a few snippets of some people that are really making a difference. Gina Seymour grew up spending hours in the Queensboro Public Library in New York. She would follow her grandmother around, who was a clerk. She loved to look at all of the diversity of books and stories. Unlike her own school library that had just a few titles, Seymour said she would go to the public library and read and read about children so different than who she was. As an adult, she realized it was her call, her ultimatum, her mandate to help those children that she read about in those books. And so she wanted a hands-on way to make a difference. She created the program Maker Care. She invited children and youth to join her to make different kinds of hands-on projects that could offer love and care to those less fortunate. We give kids the experience that they may not have ever seen or known about because they are not of low income. And so they talk about how that transforms them. 
They show empathy. They make quilts and blankets and other things to offer warmth and love and hope. Seymour says her daily inspiration is that she wants everyone to feel included. Most of the children who receive the blankets and hats and different things that are made by the youth and children are those who are in special education classes or are refugees. Her focus is to spread love. For she says, now is the time for kindness and inclusion. Or how about this change agent? His name is Danny Keith. Danny Keith grew up in Santa Cruz, California in the 1980s. Danny and his family often worried, would there be enough to eat? His mother often would say, will there be enough tonight? Now, in his 40s, rather than sitting back and watching other children go hungry, he has started the program Grind Out Hunger, a nonprofit that battles hunger. He, as a youth and a skateboarder, goes back to those skateboarding places and tells teens about what he experienced and what he's trying to do. And these skateboarding teens join him. They join him to help work with the local food banks to make sure that everyone in Santa Cruz is full. They have served over two million meals. But Keith notes what he loves the most is what happens when he watches a youth give back to another youth. Many of the kids feel empowered. And now not only are they offering a word of hope and a message of care about hunger, but now they're taking to other issues that are in their hearts. Cancer research, beaches that are clean, anti-bullying and more. Finally, change agent Susie Pearson, age 44. She serves as the executive director of Abused Women in Aid in Crisis. It's the only domestic violence emergency shelter in Anchorage, Alaska, where more than 50% of the women have been victims of violence and sexual assault. She says, ultimately, I would like to see the demand for our services to shift from crisis intervention to prevention. We need to live in a world without violence against women. This is just in our country alone. Agents of change. I think we can look around Greensboro and see how that's happening as well. Backpack beginnings, crayons matter, hot dish and hope, step up Greensboro, so many initiatives bubbling up. People who see and need and feel called, commanded, to make a difference and change. Everywhere we go, God is seeing, hearing, knowing the needs of the people. But God cannot do it unless God calls on us. God needs us to be partners in that change. So this summer, as things quiet down and you're taking a walk in the neighborhood or you slip away to the mountains or walk the beaches where you feel closest to God, listen. Listen for that voice. Listen for that command, that ultimatum. Stifle the excuses. Place aside those self-imposed obstacles. And when you hear your name, and you hear the word, Yatsa, say yes. Say yes. Yes, Lord, I will be the face, the hands, the feet, the heart of the triune God that models change in the person of Jesus Christ. Say yes what it means to being reformed within ourselves and reforming our communities and our world. For deep down inside, we've always known it was never a request anyway. It's always been an imperative. An imperative for each of us, the children of God, disciples of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for an imperative, an ultimatum. Amen.